Or just a couple, I think. <clears throat> right, which of these is the largest unit? One Celsius degree, one Kelvin degree, or one Fahrenheit degree? Which one is largest? Which one's larger, one Celsius, one Kelvin, or one Fahrenheit? Remember these, these two scales are set up based on those physical properties. Uh, the Celsius and the Kelvin, the Celsius and the, or excuse me, the Celsius and the Fahrenheit scale are based on the uh, the freezing and boiling points of water. The Fahrenheit scale says the freezing point is 32 and the boiling point is 212, and then the Celsius scale says they're the same, are zero and 100. Right. And also don't forget that the Kelvin scale, while it's based on different properties, the absolute zero and the freezing point of water, that the size of a Kelvin same as the size of a Celsius degree, because they set it up that way, so that the size of a Kelvin is the same as the size of a Celsius. That's why you have those funky numbers where uh, absolute zero is zero Kelvin, and then the freezing point of water is 273. That's set off with the Celsius scale. All right, so just a few more seconds. I'll stop at 125. Very good. D is the right answer. Uh, the Celsius degree is bigger than the Fahrenheit degree, and the Kelvin is the same size as the Celsius degree. All right, it turns out that minus 40 degrees Celsius is the same temperature as minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the only point where a Celsius degree is equal to a, a Celsius temperature is equal to a Fahrenheit temperature. Uh, but is there a temperature at which the Kelvin and Celsius degree, degree scale, or the scale degree. And if so, where is that? Is it at zero degrees Celsius? That is, is zero degrees Celsius equal to zero Kelvin? Is it at minus 273 degrees Celsius? At zero Kelvin, or no, is there no point where those two scales agree? doing pretty well. Some of you don't have the right answer. Um, so at zero degrees Celsius, are zero degrees Celsius and zero Kelvin, are they the same physical temperatures? Right, that's the question you want to ask here. Similarly, is minus 273 degrees Celsius, is that the same physical temperature as minus 273 Kelvin? And is zero Kelvin the same as zero degrees Celsius? So that's the question you want to ask yourself on each of these. All right, I'm going to stop at 150. 150. Okay, very good. The, there is no uh, agreement because those two scales, they're the same size degree, but they're offset by 273, right? Zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273 degrees Celsius. Zero Celsius is equal to 273 Kelvin. Minus 273 degrees Celsius is zero Kelvin. That's absolute zero. And zero Kelvin is equal to minus 273 degrees Celsius. All right? Okay. Uh, so you need to know those scales, sort of how they work. 
you also needed to know, as I said, some of the common Celsius temperatures. Just a couple temperatures. What's the body temperature in degrees centigrade? Body temperature? It's 37. And then a, a good sort of rough room temperature is 20 to 25 degrees Celsius. So about 20, 25 degrees Celsius in this room. See, I think that's all here. Well, let me ask you some more questions. Just sort of a review a little bit on what we've been doing. Uh, let's see. Let's say that I have a roller coaster. All right, where I have a, an object that starts off here. It initially has V equals zero. I'm going to call this location B. A, rather. I'll call this B. I'll call this C. And I'll call this D. Which of those locations has the most lost my clickers. Just a second. Let me pull it back up. Not sure what happened. Alright, which of those locations has the most kinetic energy? A, B, C, or D? Which of those locations has the most kinetic energy? A, B, C, or D. And then the next question I'll ask, of course, is which has the most potential energy? And then the next question I'll ask is which has the highest speed at which of those points? But first, which has the most kinetic energy? It looks like we're coming around. Y'all ask your neighbor if you're not sure. Looks like most of you are sort of shifting around right now. I'm going to stop at 50 seconds. 50. Okay, good. B is the right answer. Uh, I'll come back and address all of these in just a second. But first, which of these has the most potential energy? A, B, C, or D? Part on a roller coaster, which has the most potential energy? All right, just a few more seconds. I'll stop it at uh, thirty. A is the right answer, has the most potential energy up here at the top. Because remember, potential energy is equal to m times g times h. So wherever the height is the most, that's where your potential energy is the highest. Where does it have the fastest speed? finish that, the next question I'm going to ask is where is the kinetic energy equal to the potential energy? But right now I'm just asking what is the fastest speed? Where does it have the fastest speed? Right, I'm going to stop at 45. 45. D is not right. B is the right answer. I can see why you put D. I think. You put D here because it's sort of on a downslope and it's accelerating downward. Is that what you were thinking? Yeah, that's, that's not a bad thinking, but it's not correct. Right? Uh, the, the where it has the fastest speed is where it has the most kinetic energy. Okay? And so it has all potential energy here. It has nothing but kinetic energy here. And with conservation energy, we have this interplay between the different energies. When I take some energy away, I put it into another category. But the total of all the energies always remains constant. So I have nothing but potential energy. You can see I have 10 joules right here. 
I have 10 joules of kinetic energy here. Now here, I'm going to have some kinetic energy and some potential energy because I'm up a certain height above the ground. So I have some kinetic, some potential. That potential energy doesn't have anything to do with speed. So any potential energy that I have is taking away from the speed. It means it's going slower. Or it's going, it's going slower here than it is here. I understand why you put P, but that's, that's not, not the right answer. Uh, let's try this last one. Kinetic energy is equal to potential energy where? A, B, C, or C. Most of you have the right answer. You're doing a good job. A lot of you still don't know. So ask your neighbor what you, what you think the right answer is. Turn to your neighbor. I think the answer is blah, blah, blah. All right. I'm going to stop at one minute. One minute. Still about half of you have the wrong answer. Or a third of you, rather. Okay, C is the right answer. Uh, Where my kinetic energy is equal to the potential energy? Let's go back to saying I have 10 joules. I'd have 10 joules of potential energy here. Here I have 10 joules of kinetic energy. Right? All of that energy has become kinetic. Here it's split half and half. I have 5 joules of potential energy. I know that because I'm at half the height that I was at at A. So because potential energy is MGH. So if I'm at half the height, that's half the potential energy. Uh, and so my potential energy is 5 joules. My kinetic energy is also 5 joules. So that means they're equal. Okay. Those are good types of questions for the exam. Gosh, whenever that exam is, I don't know, not for a couple weeks. Is that right? When is the exam? Do you mind know? Oh, yeah, I got it right here. Uh, looks like... March 26, so what's today? Yeah, not for three weeks, so we're, we're okay for now. Exam will probably cover three chapters, huh? Probably so, yeah. This chapter and one to one and a half other chapters. Alrighty, folks. I've done it pretty well on that. Uh, so what do you call cheese that doesn't belong to you? Nacho cheese. Nacho, you all heard that one? Seriously? <laughs> Okay, uh, where does a one-legged woman work? I don't know. Uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, what was that one? Oh, shoot. Oh, what do you call Santa's helpers? I'll tell you this one already. What do you call Santa's helpers? Subordinate clauses. <laughs> I'll tell you English instructor that. I love it. They'll love you for it, for sure. All right, uh, let's see. So we did. OK, let's look at heat flow of thermal energy. So we're sort of talking about thermal energy. And before, we talked about temperature scales. Now, temperature is a measure of the amount of thermal energy. So now we're going to get into heat flow of thermal energy. Oh, by the way, guys, don't forget you have a quiz at the end of this class, your reading quiz. And this is our fourth reading quiz, is that right? So after this, any quizzes that we have, that's lanyap, as they say. So your, your lowest quiz grade will be dropped. Oh, okay. Well, after the next quiz, then. <laughs> so we'll probably have three more quizzes at least. Uh, let's see. So heat flow of thermal energy. Okay, well, first thing, we just want to make a couple of statements about thermal energy and substances. Uh, the total amount of energy inside an object
depends on the type and the amount of material. The type of material and the amount of the material. as well as the temperature. I don't think we're not going to do calorimetry, but this is a statement of the calorimetry equation. You'll probably seen this. I'm going to write it. I'm not going to test you on it, but I just want to write it here. So maybe it'll jog your memory a little bit. So when we talk about the amount of energy, we have this Q is equal to MC. Don't write this down. You can if you want, but uh, you remember this equation from high school physical science or chemistry perhaps? This is called the calorimetry equation and it talks about the amount of heat energy that you have within a substance. It actually talks about the heat flow of energy. Uh, but here we have, uh, this is the amount of energy, this is the amount of material, right? This is something we call the specific heat, which gives us the type of material, and then this is the temperature. And those three combined will tell us how much thermal energy is contained within a substance. Right? So if I have a high specific heat, like water, for example, has a very high specific heat, then it contains a lot of energy at a certain temperature. Don't worry about that equation. But when we talk about thermal energy, it's dependent upon the type of material. Some materials just contain more energy than others. The uh, amount of the material, and then also the temperature of the material. Uh, we also need to define thermal contact. Thermal contact um, it just means that when two materials are touching and it allows for the flow of thermal energy. So uh, when the flow of thermal energy is allowed between two objects. Between, is allowed between the uh, between two objects. The flow of thermal energy between two. I'm sorry, I didn't have this written down. This was. All right. So for example, like if I'm standing in front of a fire, we got to go camping, right? And I have a fire. That's my fire. It's kind of wicked looking, isn't it? It's glued down in there. All right. Um, and then I'm standing here. I have a certain amount of thermal contact between me and the fire. We'll talk about different ways that thermal energy is transmitted between us. So there is a certain amount of thermal contact. Even though I'm not in the fire or touching the fire, I can feel the heat of the fire, right? So we'll talk about that. That's due to radiation from the fire. However, sometimes, you know, I like to roast marshmallows in the fire. And so I'll take my little rod here and I'll stick it in the fire, have a marshmallow. And sometimes these metal rods, if you just use them like a coat hanger or whatever, and you hold it in the fire, what happens to it? It gets hot, right? And then the, the heat actually travels up the metal rod, and then you drop your marshmallow into the fire, and you, know, you start crying or whatever it is that you do. All right, so that's also thermal contact, but that's direct thermal contact. So it actually, we're actually having the flow of energy by conduction, which is another way that we'll talk about how thermal energy flows. So we have radiation, conduction, and then there's another type of way that we can have contact between two sources of energy, or between, say, a fire and a person, and that's something called convection. So let's say you had a fan right here, and it was blowing it from the fire onto you, blowing a hot air onto you, and that's like when your central heating unit, right? That's basically what your central heating unit does, is it has a flame, and it blows air over it, and it blows the heat all the way throughout the house. Okay, so we'll talk about those three means uh, thermal energy transfer, radiation, convection, and conduction as we go along in this chapter. We'll see sort of how they work. All right.
um, thermal equilibrium Uh, let me write that out. Thermal equilibrium. This occurs I'm Sorry, I'm all over the place here. Uh, occurs when um, there is no flow of heat between two objects. This only occurs when you have the same temperature. All right, so for example, if I have two objects here, one is at 100 degrees Celsius, and then one is at say 50 degrees Celsius, there will be a transfer of energy from one to the other. In which direction will the flow of energy go? Will it go from left to right or right to left? Left to right, right? My energy is always going to flow from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. So until they reach thermal equilibrium, these two materials are going to have a flow of energy from the higher temperature to the lower temperature. So I'll have heat exchange in that direction until the two substances reach the same temperature, say 75 degrees Celsius, or whatever it is, and then there's no longer any, they're in thermal equilibrium at that point. So that's what we, how we define thermal equilibrium, but it only occurs when our temperature is going to be the same. Okay? I have a cool little video about this, it's kind of fun, uh, about temperature and then also how uh, thermal energy goes back and forth between materials. We're about to get into this, but I think it's still a good time to show this. So let me show it to you. So I'm a little girl, she, uh, she always complains. We're having a cold night tonight, right? It's going to be freezing, like literally 31 degrees. And uh, she always complains when she gets into bed because why? When you get into bed, how do the sheets feel here? They feel really cold. And so she likes to instead of lay on top of the blanket, and then she'll pull like her comforter on top of her, like this little thin blanket. And I, of course, always tell her, like, Ada, listen, the sheets are the same temperature as the blanket. And it's not really, they have to be the same temperature, right? They're right next to one another. Even though they feel a lot colder, they're still the same temperature. But the blanket is a lot warmer, or it feels warmer anyway, just because of the rate at which it takes energy away from your body. It takes energy away from your body at a much lower rate than the sheets do. And that's why it feels warmer, because it doesn't take as much energy from your body. All right, so y'all remember that tonight as you crawl into your bed at 3 a.m. or whenever y'all go to bed or whatever, all right, when it's freezing cold outside. Uh, see, I have some of the blocks. I watched this video for the first time, by the way, several years ago. And I never understood what he was talking about, like the aluminum. I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe it was some exotic material. And then I found on the internet that you could buy these blocks. But it's not really aluminum. What is it? Aluminum. aluminum. Not aluminum, but aluminum. I don't know where the other I comes from. A bit strange. It's crazy. All right, but anyway, so here's an aluminum block, and then this is a, this is a plastic block. And if you feel them, they do feel much different in temperature. Like the, the aluminum block feels very cold. But I also have a, a little thermometer. I'll pass this around. You can play around with it. The thermometer is kind of cool. Don't point it at your friend or anything. But you just you can point it, and it tells me the board is 72 degrees. That's 70 degrees. Uh, wow, that's probably too far away. That's got hot. And then if you do the, this is the aluminum block, it's 73 degrees, and then if you do the plastic block, it's also 73 degrees, uh, even though they feel a lot different. Y'all can play around with these, pass them around. Yeah. 
but it all has to do with the thermal conductivity, which we're going to get into in just a bit. Uh, well, let's first, before we do that, let's look at the phases of matter. In fact, I'm not even going to write down the things for the phases of matter, because I think y'all know the phases, right? What are they? Right, but can I show you a song? Is that okay? Because it's a really good song. Y'all like They Might Be Giants? Ever heard they, they Might Be Giants? No. Okay, well this is They Might Be Giants. They're sort of a, I don't know, a funky rock band or whatever. Not funky, but what's the word? Cultish. That's the word. They're cultish. But they do this series of science videos. Uh, Alright, uh, the cool thing about solids, liquids, and gases, though, is that we, we don't usually think about every material can be either a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Right? So, like, uh, metals can be either a solid as they usually are, or at extreme temperatures, they can be a liquid, or even in more extreme temperatures, they can become a gas. And similarly, for things like, you know, Helium, for example, and it's usually a gas, right? But as we saw in the video, I don't know, a few weeks ago, with the supercooled helium, it becomes a what? A very, very liquid. It becomes a liquid at extremely low temperatures. I don't think it can become a solid, uh, not, not realistically, anyway. But anyway, we can have these uh, these different things in different phases of matter. All right, uh, let's look now at conduction. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry, we are going to do calorimetry. Uh, we'll do calorimetry first, and then we'll look at conduction. Calorimetry is just the study of, of how energy flows between substances. Uh, it tells how much energy causes a change in temperature. Right, so if you raise the temperature of a substance by a certain amount, then that requires a certain amount of energy. And through these methods of calorimetry, we can figure out how much energy is required to raise the temperature. So say, for example, if I were to plot the change, the temperature on one scale and the amount of energy required on another scale, say for a block of, uh, of metal, like aluminium, as I add energy to this, the temperature will increase. Or I can think about it as the temperature increases, I have to add energy to this. It's a linear relationship. It's given by this. I gave this earlier. But Q is equal to M times C times delta T. So we are going to see this, okay, for calorimetry. Uh, this should be in your book, I'm pretty sure. Is this in your book, this equation? It is. Why don't say anything before when I was telling you that it wasn't? It's <laughs> All right, so this is the calorimetry equation. Uh, Q is just an energy. It's measured in either joules or calories. M is a mass. Delta T is the temperature. And this C is called the specific heat. All right, the specific heat is uh, the amount of energy required to raise a substance's temperature by a certain amount. Let me rephrase that a little bit. Let me clarify. It's not actually an amount of energy because the units of specific heat are going to be uh, joules per kilogram degree Celsius. So when I ask about the specific heat, I say for this substance, does it require a lot? Oh, oh, put it in his eye. <laughs> 
right. Uh, it asks, what was I saying? Um, Emily? I'm sorry. <laughs> For a particular substance, how much energy is required to raise the temperature of that substance by a certain amount? So, for example, wood, does it have a big specific heat or a small specific heat, say compared to, I don't know, aluminium? Does wood have a bigger or smaller specific heat than aluminium? That means, does it require more or less energy to raise the temperature of wood than it would to be to raise the temperature of aluminium? More or less energy for wood to raise the temperature of it. More energy, right. So wood then has a bigger or smaller specific heat than aluminum. It's much bigger. So uh, how about air? Does it have a bigger or smaller specific heat than wood? It has a bigger specific heat. Air has a very high specific heat. That's why your uh, your uh, blankets. That's why they have uh, a lower thermal conduction. That they don't conduct thermal energy as much because air requires a lot of energy to raise its temperature. And so when you lay on thermal sheets or like flannel sheets, they gather up a whole bunch of air around the little fibers, and that's why they feel warmer because they have a lot of air around them. Similarly, that's why we use. Uh, Ice chests, because ice chests are basically just air, right? They're made out of styrofoam, but the styrofoam is just sort of a by it. Really, the styrofoam are little bubbles of air, and bubbles of air have a very high specific heat. So it requires a lot of energy to raise their temperature by a certain amount. So that means their temperature doesn't change very much. Okay? All right. Um, There's something else regarding calorimetry called the latent heat. And this is the energy required to change phases. That means to go from a, a solid to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. We have two different latent heats. We have the heat of vaporization. And the heat of, gosh, what do they call it in your book? You might know. I'll look it up as we go. There are a couple of different. Fusion. And they call it the latent heat of fusion. All right, the heat of vaporization is the amount of energy to go from, say, a liquid to a gas or to a vapor. And then the heat of fusion is the amount of energy required to go from a solid to a liquid. So if I make that plot of energy versus temperature, so I have energy here and temperature here. Let's say that I'm dealing with water for this graph, H2O. Uh, down here I have ice. As I put energy into ice of a certain temperature, it doesn't change. The temperature doesn't change. So let's say that I have ice at minus 20 degrees Celsius. And I put energy into this ice. Right, so I continue to put energy, energy, energy into this ice. Actually, let me redraw this a little bit. I'm going to draw this at not as temperature, but as time. All right, so. What this represents then is that for a certain amount of time, I put energy into this ice, and then, sorry guys, I'm going to change this y-axis to, I'm going to put this as temperature. So I can imagine this being a block of ice sitting on a fire, 
And as time goes, I'm gradually putting energy into that ice. You follow what I'm saying? No, right. Can I rewind 20 seconds? All right, so let's imagine I have this block of ice, right? It's at a temperature of minus 20 degrees Celsius. That's my beginning point. I have some source of energy that I'm pouring into this ice. So as time goes on, I pour more and more energy into this ice. You follow me? Right. Now, uh, something's going to happen to that ice as I pour more and more energy into it. First of all, the temperature of the ice is going to increase until it reaches a certain temperature. What temperature is that? When it will begin to turn into water. Okay. It's going to, once it reaches zero degrees Celsius, then the ice will begin to turn into water. And then once it all turns into water, the temperature will increase more and more until it reaches what temperature? Huh? Mm -hmm. Not room temperature, but 100 degrees Celsius. And once it reaches 100 degrees Celsius, that when it begins to boil, and it starts to turn into a gas. All right. So if I plot out this graph, um, Get rid of this. As I pour energy into it, the temperature doesn't change. All right, we'll say that this is uh, this is at zero degrees Celsius, and then after it turns into water, then the temperature begins to increase. So in this phase, I have water. At some point, the temperature reaches 100 degrees Celsius. At that point, I, I'm still pouring energy into it, and in this part of the phase, I have water plus steam. Some of the water is converted into steam, and some of it is still just 100 degrees water, but it's not yet made into steam yet. And then at some point, all that water turns into steam, and the temperature of that steam rises. All right, the point here is that there is a point in between phases when I have to pour energy into that substance, and that provides the latent heat of fusion or the latent heat of vaporization. It's the amount of energy required to go in between phases. So for example, here, uh, where the temperature is not changing, what is the energy going towards? Is it going towards the latent heat of fusion or latent heat of vaporization? This is going towards the heat, latent heat of vaporization because it's changing that water into steam, but it's not changing the temperature. These latent heats of fusion and vaporization are very, very big. It takes a lot of energy to change water from a liquid to a gas, or it takes a lot of energy to change water from a liquid to a solid. Right? That's why, for example, when you talk about burns, what's a lot worse for you to get, hot, to get burned. Is it very hot water, say 100 degrees Celsius, or very hot steam at 100 degrees? If you have steam and you have water both at 100 degrees Celsius, which of those will cause a greater burn? Right? Steam. The steam causes a much worse burn because it uh, it has a lot of extra energy. Because instead of being where right here, 100 degree water, it <coughs> it already has this extra energy that has come from the latent heat of vaporization. That will become important later. We're going to talk evaporation in terms of your body and how that this latent heat of vaporization will become important and how our body cools itself. Because our body takes droplets of water on the skin and then they evaporate, and so they carry away that latent heat of fusion or vaporization from your body when you sweat. The vaporization. They carry away this large amount of energy, the little droplets of sweat on your body, uh, and that causes your body to cool. So we'll see this again soon when we talk about the body's cooling system. All right. Um, I have a little clip about calorimetry. They use calorimetry to find the, num the amount of energy in food, and what they do is they just take a certain amount of food and they put it into a container and they blow it up and then they measure the change in temperature of that container. Uh, they take into account sort of what they had to do to blow up the food, but then the food actually combusts and they measure what is the change in temperature due to combustion of that food. 
And then, depending upon that change in temperature, they can ask, well, what is the mass and what is the specific heat going back here? And figure out how much energy is actually contained in that food. They use something called a bomb calorimeter. And this is a, an interview with a guy that does this for a living, that he determines the caloric content of food. Let's see. guys so the point there is that if you know if you can find uh, what they did they took these little pieces of fruit cake and they put them into a bath of water and then they exploded them and then they measured what is the change in temperature of the water and if you find the change in temperature of the water you know its specific heat and you know its mass then you can find the amount of energy that was introduced from the fruit cake into the water when they exploded it all right so simple idea but it's pretty useful to find how much energy is in a substance couple more things and then we're going to sort of move into the uh, like the body portion of this chapter which we'll do next time we'll stop soon I'll let you take your quiz uh, but when we have energy transfer there are three different ways that energy is transferred first of those is conduction that's like me putting a marshmallow fork into the fire uh, conduction comes about by direct contact and we can calculate the amount of energy transfer as Q over T is equal to K times the area, the change in temperature over the distance. You're not going to have to do any calculations with this, but I want you to know how this energy transfer, this rate of conduction, is dependent upon these different things. So first of all, this is just the rate of conduction. It is an energy per time, energy over time. So if I have a bigger rate of conduction, that means I'm pushing more energy in a faster amount of time. Right. And then we have several things. Uh, the K is just a constant. It's thermal conductivity. All right, thermal conductivity is dependent upon the type of material. So, for example, uh, something with a high thermal conductivity will conduct thermal energy really well. Something with a low thermal conductivity will conduct thermal energy not very well. So, a brass rod or a wooden pole, which of those would conduct thermal energy better? The brass or the wood? The brass. Metals are usually pretty good thermal conductors. In fact, they're good electrical conductors too, right? And for the same reason, because they, they have these electrons within them that move around very readily. And so those electrons are able to transfer energy, be it thermal or electrical energy, to you pretty easily. So thermal conductivity, I think that's sort of intuitive. Metals often have a very high thermal conductivity. Other things <coughs> like wood and plastic have a low thermal conductivity. High just means that it conducts thermal energy really well. So if the thermal conductivity goes up, with all else being equal, the rate of conduction will also go up. Okay. Uh, the next thing is the A, which is the, uh, the area of the substance. All right, so I don't know if I'm, if I lean with my whole back up against a big block of ice, that's going to cause for a lot of thermal transfer of energy. Whereas if I just touch it with my finger, that'll have a lot less transfer of energy. Right. So if you have a bigger surface area exposed to whatever the material is, then you're going to have a higher rate of energy transfer. Uh, delta T is the difference in temperatures between the two substances. to the extreme that if the two substances are of the same temperature, what is going to be the rate of energy transfer? It's zero, right? And that goes back to what we were talking about before, one of those laws of thermodynamics. So if they're the same temperature, there's no flow of energy between them. If they have a really high energy, or a really high difference in temperature, then that means Q over T is gonna go up. So for all three of these, actually, whether it be the area 
If I have my, a big area, that means my rate of energy transfer goes up. If I have a big difference in temperature, that means that rate of energy transfer goes up. Now, the last one here is D, which is the, uh, the distance. Yeah, the distance between this. Yeah, the distance between them. So, for example, let's say that I have two substances here and here. They're sur they are uh, separated by a rod, and this rod is through which the energy will travel. If this rod is bigger or longer, rather, then that's going to cause my energy rate of transfer to go up or to go down. If I make the length of this rod longer and longer, it's going to make it go down. All right, so I have one substance here, another substance here. They have a difference in temperature. The area would represent the area of this rod. The distance, D, would represent the length of this rod that connects these two, that puts these two in thermal contact. All right, so as that distance D goes up, then that means that the rate of energy transfer will go down. All right, is that clear? You'll have this equation, right? But you'll need to know as I change these different things, what happens to the rate of energy transfer. And I'll probably ask it of you in words. So for example, if the thermal conductivity goes up, what then happens to the rate of energy transfer? It goes up, right. Oh no, uh, yeah, as the thermal conductivity goes up, the rate of energy transfer goes up. Okay? All right, just a few, couple more things. I know you are anxious to take your quiz. Well, let me just list these other two. Now, you're not going to see an equation, but you do need to know what they are. And that is convection. Convection, and then also radiation. These are both methods of energy transfer, thermal energy transfer. Uh, this is caused by the movement of air. Right, a great example is like a, a central heating unit. Right, the source here of your heat in your central heating unit if it's gas, it's a flame, or it's a, an electric heating element inside your central heating unit. But you're not actually touching it, right? And you're not actually seeing it. There's, you're not near it anyway. In fact, it can be in a completely different room. But it forces the air around that flame and then forces it out into your home. So it heats the air and then forces it out into your home. That's called a convection. Convection ovens work by this method. Right? You all know what happens in a convection oven? It's not really a fancy oven, although they can be fancy, but basically they just have a what? A convection. They, all they have is a fan, and that causes the air to circulate inside the oven, and so you get a greater energy transfer between the oven and the food item. And then the next thing is radiation. This is the transfer of energy by radiation. Or light. So imagine that you have a fire. Right, I'm over here. This fire will actually emit little waves of energy. It's called radiation. We'll have a whole chapter on that later. Uh, that goes outward away from the fire and it, it touches, or it, it reaches you, and that actually causes you to heat up. So you actually have radiation, thermal radiation, that you can feel the fire. You're not touching the fire. You don't have wind blowing from the fire, but it's just the electromagnetic radiation or the light energy that's reaching you. All right. Okay, next time we're going to get into energy in the body. I'm going to go ahead and give you your quiz before we move into that topic. And we're going to revisit a lot of these topics. Uh, but sort of how they uh, apply to the human body. Any questions sort of about where we are? No? All right, well, please should be pretty straightforward. Um, just like before, you have the, uh, the form on the back. If you could please uh, bubble your ID number again.